Uh, good evening, everybody. So tonight's lecture is a part of the Black History Month Florence Initiative, which was co-founded by one of the professors here at NYU Florence, Justin Randolph Thompson, in 2016. And through the collaboration with many institutions, Black History Month Florence is meant to celebrate and to create a dialogue about the diversity of African and Afro-descendant cultures in the context of Italy. And though immigration from Africa continues to increase, black and African Italians are not a new phenomenon here in Italy. And as Mauro Valeri said during a lecture here a couple weeks ago, Italy tends to forget people who are not Italian descendants or don't look Italian. And Black History Month Florence is meant to combat that ideology by creating a platform for artists, students, anyone who wants to challenge the flattened narratives about African cultures here in Italy. This February, we ran 63 events, which range from lectures, workshops, music events, art exhibits, dances, and tours. And I'd like to thank NYU Florence, who has been here from the beginning in 2016 when this initiative started, and La Pietra Dialogues, and the coordinator of LPD, Megan Matters. And as I said before, tonight's lecture is a part of Black History Month Florence Initiative, and we have the pleasure of having Dr. Angelica Pessarini speak with us this afternoon. And she's also a professor here at NYU Florence. She teaches the Black Italia class, which is a course entirely based on the investigation of race in Italy. And it is a course that she designed herself to um, address the issues of race in Italy, and it's most likely the only course in Italy that deals with this matter. So Professor Pessarini has her PhD in sociology from the Center of Interdisciplinary, <laughs> Interdisciplinary Gender Studies at the University of Leeds. And her work investigates the visual radicalization practices located at the intersection of race, gender, and identity in colonial and post-colonial times with a specific focus in Italy. So without further ado, I'll pass the mic off to Professor Angelica Pessarini. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alex, for introducing me. Uh, I know there were some very long interdisciplinary, yeah. Um, so before starting, I would like to um, thank a few people. So uh, first of all, Justin, who is here somewhere, who kindly invited me to prepare this talk. Um, and I really appreciate his invitation. And um, the La Pietra Dialogue staff, Megan, Maria, who helped me so much in organizing this talk. And then NYU in general for supporting uh, this event. Um, I wanted to start in a different way. And then something happened to me on Friday. And so I kind of decided to shift a bit the beginning of this paper, which is an episode, an episode that really relates to the topic of the paper, but also to the general um, climate going on in Italy at the moment. So I was on uh, the bus, number 25, coming up here. Many students are familiar with this. Um, and so this bus is really, there are strange dynamics on this bus, I noticed, because there are always quite a number of African young men uh, sitting at the back, and then usually students sitting in the middle, and other people sitting at the front. And uh, um, I was sitting in the middle with NYU students, and in front of me there was a couple, they were like 14, 15, it was 1.30, so ju they just left school, and they were going back home. And uh, they were just talking, and I couldn't prevent myself from hearing what they were saying. And they were cute, you know, talking about their little things at school, the test to pass, math to prepare. And then um, she needed to see if her next bus was coming, so she needed to go towards the back of the bus. And uh, she says to the boyfriend, oh, but I need to sit close to that Negro, because there were these migrants sitting at the back. And for a second, I felt my blood freezing. And I think when you hear the word, there is a responsibility given to you. You can accept it or not, but I personally think it's a responsibility given to you. And so I was thinking, should I say something or not? Yeah, I should say something. And so I talked to the girl, and I was about to get off. And I said to her, hi, sorry, I just heard what you say. And I just was wondering if you know this is an insult. And her face was, she had a little smile, sort of embarrassed smile, 
But she was also shocked, maybe to see someone addressing her about what she just said. And so I carry on saying to her, you know, what you said is a, is a, is a racial slur. Are you aware of this? And she was just not responding silence. He just hugged her boyfriend a bit more. He was really mortified and he said to me, oh sorry, don't listen to her. And I told him I had to listen to her because the word came just through my ear. And uh, she was just in silence, not saying anything. And so I told her that by saying that word, she just didn't insult that young man. She was also insulting me, my father, and my mother, and my family. And I also told her that, you know, there are also Italians who are non-white, and so maybe next time when she thinks about this word, maybe she can have a thought about it. And then, with just the weakest voice, she said to me, Miss Cousy, I apologize. And she was really, she meant it, you know. But what was shocking for me was not just the use of the N-word, but also the fact that for a, for a young Italian woman, sitting close to a black African man means sitting close to that, you know, the, the, the repulsion on her face, the disgust, like if it, this person wasn't a person. And so this episode made me think about the general climate going on in Italy, the political discourse, the political response or lack of response in relation to certain incredibly serious events that just happened. And so I was thinking, why have we reached the point when sitting close to a young black man labeled as a migrant is so disgusting and so repulsive? And why we are in in a situation where a white Italian man takes a gun and goes in the street shooting black people. And I was thinking, if I was there in Macerata, he wouldn't ask me, do you have an Italian passport? Do you speak Italian? Are you Italian? He just would have looked at the amount of melanin in my face and he probably would have done the same to me. And so I think, yeah, that was this episode connected to the, this climate uh, made me writing down a few considerations. And one of the major issues with the perception of race in modern Italy refers to what Alessandro Portelli defines Italian self-reflexive color blindness. What occurs in Italy, says, is not simply a denial of race, rather than seem themselves as white. According to Portelli, Italians see themselves as normal. As a result, because color is unspoken and not openly mentioned, it is believed that there is no danger in racism, of, there is no danger of racism. And so such a structural color blindness is problematic because it associates whiteness with normality and consequently, consequently with Italianness. Simply put, to be Italian is to be white. So within this discourse, those who do not fit this alleged Italian type are deemed outside the nation on a number of levels. So in order to understand and unpack such dynamics, it is necessary to consider the category of race and the influence this had on the construction of Italian national identity. So if race is a social construct, devoid of scientific validity, it still retains enormous power in the modern world. In the case of Italy, the racial construction of national identity shows a complex ambivalence embedded in discursive practices revolving around an ambiguous production of both whiteness and blackness. Such an ambiguity, uh, as highlighted by Tatiana <coughs> Petrovic, stems from Italians' liminal double racial status as racializer of Jews, of Southern Italians, of Africans, and racialized subject in the US, in Australia. And as a result, race in Italy today seems to be located within the interstices of a polarized discourse based on the notion of unspoken whiteness, able to visually recognize Italians from the others, namely those called stranieri, foreigners, or extracomunitari, which was a term used to define migrants coming from outside the EU. And now we have this new category, migrants. 
So although cholera is not openly named, meaningful biological connotations based on phenotypic features located on the body are at the core of national identity. And it is important to notice that such a disjunction doesn't work merely at a visual level. The racialization of a national identity, in fact, transversally affects Italian society and the everyday life of racialized subject, going from education, housing, labor rights, work opportunities, political participation, health and personal safety, and the legal discourse too. So owing to the interdependence of colonialism, ideas of race and mixed race, and the normative construction of whiteness in relation to national identity, it seems necessary to me to investigate the nexus of race, citizenship, and belonging in order to illustrate the reason why in contemporary Italy the idea of blackness associated with Italianness still appears to some as an impossible semantic match, an irreconcilable paradox, or a dangerous gift that we shouldn't give. So in order to do so, it is crucial to trace back the racial history of Italian identity starting from the liberal period, which began approximately in 1861 with the unification of Italy. The analysis of racial norms in shaping national identity are strictly connected to the history of European colonialism. And this is a story that deeply concerns Italy too. Normative whiteness, scientific racism, ideas of blood purity had a crucial impact on the formation of national identity in Italy. And the analysis of the meanings and power relationship inscribed on certain bodies reveals how the historical normative construction of the black body as inferior and deviant has been fundamental for the fragile functioning of Italy as a racial nation marked by the persistence of the specific color line divide. So in order to show how race is at the core of the contemporary cultural and political discourse on citizenship, I will focus on a series of decrees, racial laws and political acts enacted both during the liberal and fascist period and introduced to regulate the legal identity of mixed race Italians born in the former colonies. In the second part, I will discuss the current citizenship law and the legacy of some ties with the former fascist legislation. However, I would also like to integrate this information with the precious testimonies of the children born in that period, whose stories I've gathered during my fieldwork in East Africa in, uh, in, and in Italy in 2012. So just to give you an idea about the geographical context, we are talking about uh, East Africa, so Eritrea, Ethiopia, and Somalia. And the first Italian possession in East Africa dated back 1869, when an Italian shipping company bought the Bay of Assab on the coast of modern Eritrea. Later on, the bay was sold to the Italian state and declared an Italian colony in 1882, and the official domination over East Africa started in 1890 when all the Italian possession gained until that moment were legally consolidated into a single political entity named Eritrea. So in terms of sex ratio, it's interesting to notice an initial marked imbalance considering that in 1905, so 15 years after the uh, official beginning of the colonial domination, in 1905, 80% of the European men living in colonial Eritrea were aged over 16 and they were not married. The majority, the majority of those married went to Africa without their wives. And among the 482 women living in the colony, only 73 were not married. So before the introduction of racial laws between 1937 and 1940, and despite the presence of prostitutes and state-controlled brothels, Italian long-term residents usually had relationships with local women within a practice known as madamato or madamismo, literally meaning having a relationship with a madama. This term applied to Italian men, sorry, This term uh, applied to concubines who who would temporarily live with Italian men, and they quote, performing domestic and sexual services and being rewarded in kind or money. 
Matamatu was built on an existing uh, form of temporary marriage in Eritrea, known as Demos, consisting of an Eritrean woman, normally a Coptic Christian, who, and I quote again, commits herself directly or through her family to live in conjugal union with the men for a given length of time and for the payment of a given sum. According to Eritrean customary norms, the father of the children had to provide economic support to his partner and their offspring. So Italians, when they arrived in Eritrea, they saw this practice and they kind of tried to use it by twisting a bit the terms of this contract. Because although a certain number of men legally recognized their children and provided for them, archival studies like the ones conducted by Giulia Barrera or Gianluca Gabrielli show that many men, especially military officials and those whose tenure in Africa was temporary, dismissed these norms and left their female partners and children. And this is precisely what happened to one of my respondents, who I will call Bruna. Bruna was a woman born in 1940, and you will see in a moment how important this year was, from an Ethiopian mother and the white Italian father who never recognized her, so she never met her Italian father. Because of her very light complexion and blonde hair, she would constantly pass as white. But in periods of formal racial segregation, this practice provided passer with advantages and opportunities denied to the darker member of the same racialized group. And it was also considered a way to subvert and resist racist and racial norms. In the case of Bruna, however, passing as white in fascist Eritrea had a dramatic impact on her life. Before carrying on with Bruna's story, though, I would like to contextualize a bit better uh, this historical period in which she was born and the policies adopted to regulate race and citizenship in the colonies. So despite contrasting opinions on mixed race, mixed race offspring, from the beginning of the Italian presence in East Africa, colonial governors found it necessary to implement a corpus of laws defining the juridical status of citizens and subjects and to regulate interracial relationships due to the number of mixed race children born in the colonies. The juridical status of mixed race children was formally addressed for the first time in 1909, so quite quite early, with the publication of the Codice Civile per la Colonia Eritrea. The Article 5 of this code affirmed that the citizenship could be granted to an individual born uh, from an Italian citizen and a colonial subject, while Article 8 stated that in case of unknown parents, a child born in the colonies could gain Italian citizenship only if their physical features excluded the possibility they could be related to a colonial subject. So although this code was never implemented, it was used as a juridical framework in cases dealing with the citizenship of mixed race children until the promulgation of further legislation in 1933. And I would like to underline here what I consider the crucial importance of this code in shaping not only future legislation on citizenship and belonging, but also for forging modern perceptions of national identity. With this code, we witness the process of the racialization of national identity, namely how Italian citizenship and identity became discursively associated with specific meanings ascribed to measurable phenotypic features located on the body and considered as belonging to Italianness. In other words, we can observe the production of the Italian body as performantly constituted within particular sets of discursive regimes and how this body became meaningful. Simultaneously, such a discursive maneuver about, brought about the materialization of the body of the other, deemed outside the realm of the nation precisely because lacking those physical features attributed to the white and therefore real Italian citizen. So a further development after this 1909 code that was never implemented, we go to 1933. Um, and this, we are, we are under the fascist regime already. So if the civil code, as observed, provided anthropological ground on which to grant citizenship, the 1933 Ordinamento Organico per l'Eritrea e la Somalia 
clearly reflected the impact of theories, theorizations of race going on in Italy. Article 18 of the law 999 stated that children recognized by their Italian father had the juridical right to be considered as legally Italian because of patrilineality, um, according to which a child's racial identity was determined by paternal descent alone, regardless of the mother's ethnicity. Yet, it is in relation to the case of unrecognized children Instead, that we can notice the greatest impacts of racial purity theorizations on Italian juridical discourse concerning identity and citizenship. So similarly, similarly to the Spanish proof of blood purity, unrecognized mixed race children could gain Italian citizenship if able to demonstrate on their body the signs of phenotypic features indicating clear racial intermixing with a member of the white race or, as scholar Barbara Sorgoni puts it, to pass the proof of race. This proof was su successfully completed after a series of craniometrical tests, which included the morphological analysis of the skull and the measurement of the cranial capacity. The racial ascertainment was followed by the cultural verification of Italianness, demonstrated by the presence in the mixed race subject of some cultural features able to show the complete assimilation of the dominant race spirit, such as the level of education, so a child had to be third grade of elementary school, lack of criminal records, monogamy, and religion practiced. And interestingly, the discourse on blood and citizenship was not only racialized, but also heavily gendered. Giulia Barrera demonstrates how the recognition of mixed race children by Italian men was accepted because of the belief in the superiority of male genes, a factor that in situation of sexual intercourse with members of so-called inferior races could guarantee the child would have the physical immunity of the mother without losing the intellectual qualities of the father. Yet, despite having passed the proof of race, many mixed race Italian women sought the requested for citizenship denied due to their alleged misconduct and bad moral. Likewise, some Italian Eritrean men saw their rights denied in case of marriage or cohabitation with an Eritrean woman. Therefore, as Barrera argues, the colonial government didn't consider citizenship for mixed race individuals as their right, but rather as a selective process aimed at the docilization and control of this potentially dangerous group. And with the birth of the empire, in the meantime, I wanted to show you here some uh, dates. Um, so 1936 is when there is the invasion of Ethiopia and the creation of the empire. And this was a bit the propaganda, the images used at the time. Um, so as you can see here is the black body literally uh, losing the color. Uh, so brusca estrella, rub, rub down. Um, also, this one is called civilizing mission. Um, and so this woman says to her partner, uh, come on, Taitu, we are starting to get in civilized. This one came out white. And this one, we can see the gender and racial connotation. Here we are in a slave market, and these two fascist soldiers, they say, uh, mettiamo tanto per uno, che poi facciamo a mezzo. So let's both put some money together, and then we can share. And this one at the post office, again, uh, this soldier uh, says to the employee, I would like to um, send this souvenir from Oriental Africa to a friend of mine. Vorrei sfedere ad un mio amico questo ricordo dell'Africa orientale. So, um, with the birth of the empire, Mussolini saw, uh, tried to create clear boundaries between colonizer and colonized. And therefore, a body of laws were promulgated aimed at the protection of what it called at the time the Italian race, at the time, but keep this word in mind because we will see in 2018 if these words are so unusual. Um, 
a body of law promulgated at the protection of the Italian race in the colonies. So Alessandro Lessona, who was the minister for the colonies, briefed Italian governors in Africa on the new institutional segregationist directions to follow in the colonies, including, and I quote, a clear separation of social life and housing between whites and blacks, any attitudes of familiarity with natives and a supremacy of the white race in the everyday life. So the first racial decree dated January 1937 stated that Italian citizens having relationship of a conjugal nature with colonial subject might face imprisonment lasting from one to five years. So you could go to jail if you were having a relationship with a black woman and some people actually did go to jail. There is some archival work which uh, analyzed the uh, trials. The aim of the decree was to prevent sexual relationships between African women and Italian men in order to stop the procreation of the so-called metici. This was the called, this was the word used to define mixed race children, metici. Miscegenation was considered a serious threat to Italian blood and racial purity. And it's important to underline here the role played by the propaganda in reinforcing negative ideas of mixed race Italians. Um, Visual and textual practices were used as a tool to instill support in state ideologies and to modify, or I would say to colonize, the collective imagination. And I would like to give you an example. In 1937, the editor-in-chief of six satirical magazines were summoned to the headquarters of the Minister of Press and Propaganda in Rome. And they were instructed on the new lines to adopt in order to uh, deal with the colonial matter. And the archival document says, satirical press can and has to fight against hybridism, making races of color look at physically and more morally inferior. For instance, highlighting black women's ugliness and the distance that divides the civilization of whites compared to the civilizations of blacks. And this is what the minister, Alessandro Lessona, wrote uh, on a newspaper. So as you can see, it teaches a painful plague, a source of trouble and unquiet people, an abnormal branch of the human family. Through a further process of racialization, the regime sought to associate negative moral qualities with races of color and explained this as natural, as showed in this quote. To achieve this goal, it was developed a massive work of propaganda in order to produce a media overdrive of manipulated representations aimed at Italians and Africa, both in Italy and in the colonies. And so in this article, as I said, Lessona uh, clearly defined, this was La Stampa, so it was a major uh, Italian newspaper and this appeared in 1936. Um, the production of the racial body was also supported by the anthropological discourse, and in particular by Lidio Cipriani, who was one of the main figures in promoting anti-miscegenation. Considering the inevitable regression of the African race, in 1936, Cipriani warned the readers of La Stampa, again, about the danger of contamination and death brought about by mis mixing with African blood. And he says, only when the African is kept under the control of the European can this regression be avoided. One can then get some modest populizer of our culture and rare individuals capable of physical work and far above the average. But no progress, however, is hoped to be promoted in the future by an African. And so he carries on like dismantling this idea of intelligence uh, in relation to Africa. Um, so, this is another image um, that appeared after the, 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 the birth of the empire. So, uh, there is a prostitute asking to this fascist soldier, um, desidera more? E he says, grazie, preferisco le bianche, non voglio figli color latte. So, he says, do you want some brunettes? No, thanks, I prefer whites. I don't want cafe latte colored children. So this was just images that were really common at the time. Um, 
So another important document was the Manifesto della Razza, the Race Manifesto, presented in 1938. And this officially became the state, uh, represented the state ideology. So although the manifesto was presented as a 10 chapter document created by a group of scientists and academics, it had been edited by the anthropologist Guido Landra under Mussolini precise suggestions and indication. So the manifesto, um, I must have uh, here. So, yeah. Uh, as you can see the title, Il Fascismo e la Razza, Our Ancient Blood Purity is the greatest title of nobility of the nation. And the manifesto began by affirming the existence of races, as explained in chapter one. Uh, human races exist. Um, and is not indeed an abstraction of our spirit, but corresponds to a real phenomenon, material, perceptible with our senses. So race was no longer a feeling, as Mussolini had just said a few years before, five years earlier. Now the meaning of race relied on science and had to be explained uh, through biological terms. Uh, the manifesto not only stressed the idea of different racial composations and reiterated the Aryan origins of Italian, but it also claimed that the purity of Italian's blood had remained unchanged along the century, owing to a lack, apparently, of external contamination. Um, and as you can see, this is chapter six. The last three chapters seems to reflect the new direction followed by the regime, and the document, in fact, asked Italian to reckon with their own responsibilities as a member of a pure race, and asked them to proclaim themselves, frankly, racist. According to the text, it was imperative to distinguish European Aryan Mediterraneans from other races in order to avoid any contamination. Miscegenation was clearly addressed at the end of the document, which stated that union was uh, admissible only among European races, um, and the purely European character of the Italians would be altered by racial mixing. So uh, it was really... Um, uh, an invitation not to uh, having interracial relationship. And so a final juridical step aimed at uh, defining the mixed race body um, occurred in 1940, when I told you my respondent was born. So this was the, um, oh sorry, there is a mistake on this slide, but I can read it to you. Um, so the child born from an Italian and an African was not considered Italian anymore. So I told you how by patrilinearity a child could be Italian. Now the law had changed and it says that uh, a child born from an Italian and an African uh, was no longer an Italian anymore. They couldn't gain citizenship, they couldn't be recognized by their fathers, they couldn't be adopted, and they became uh, pure Africans. So they had to live and just with their mothers, with their African parent. And so this is what happened to Bruna. Bruna was born, as I mentioned, in 1940. 1940, Asmara, Asmara is the capital of Eritrea, um, was the center of the empire, and there was a racially segregated space. As Bruna told me, and I quote her, she said, blacks couldn't come to the center of Asmara. They were all relegated in Ukria, which is a peripheral uh, neighborhood. Asmara belonged only to whites. And having a, a white child uh, was particularly difficult for Bruna's mother, who was a black woman, black young woman, left by her Italian uh, partner, who didn't even recognize their daughter. So the violence of the racial segregation at the time is made clear in an episode Bruna told me during an interview, and it made me think about this bus again. She says, my mom, maybe I have a, a quote, yes. My mom would tell me the buses were divided. Behind there was a little space for blacks, and it was like in America. If you would sit in the front, they would beat you up. They would kick you out. And my mom told me that once we were on a bus, and this guy told her, this child is white, put her in the front, you stay behind, because he thought she would work for an Italian family. 
Nevertheless, for this respondent, passing as a white child didn't turn out to be an advantage or a resource at all, but rather this imposed whiteness became a source of pain and shame. Because given her non-assimilability in her mother's community and because of her appearance and it, the difficulty of raising a white child, being a, a, a black mother, Bruna's mother decided to leave her in a, what they were called at the time, collegi, which is not college at all, was a sort of orphanage for mixed race children run by uh, Catholic missionaries. Um, so the colonial government felt the need to conceal the shame of the empire and the placement of mixed race children into this institution worked also for that purpose. Bruna seemed to be clearly aware of the construction of her embodiment as a source of shame for Italian. Thus, the need was for it to be concealed, as she clearly affirmed. In fact, she said to me, they would lock us there because we couldn't be the shame of whites. We couldn't be the shame of the empire. Nevertheless, although feelings of shame felt by Eritrean women in relation to the social stigma attached to their children's color, these same women encouraged the Italianization of their children despite the absence of their Italian fathers. Again, as Julia Barrera notices, this was because similarly to Italian customs at the time, also in Eritrean customary laws, the father was the one responsible for the children and the one who provided for the social identity. Children had to speak their father's language and practice his religion. In this process, an Italian education played a central role and this could be achieved only within this institution for abandoned or unrecognized mixed race um, children. Um, the interview I conducted how, highlight how the collegi fulfilled an important role of social control of the mixed race body. From 1928, due to the high rate of abandonment of mixed race children living in the streets of Asmara, the colonial government decided to place children within this collegi using treasury funds. Yet it is important to bear in mind that once inside this collegio, a child would go under the care and the control of the government, which decided if and when the child could leave the premises of the institute. Therefore, when a mother decided to leave her children in a collegio, she would immediately lose any authority on them. Mothers were allowed to visit their children once a month, and the latter could never leave the institute to visit their families. So despite these restrictions for many young single mothers with very limited economic resources, this was not an unusual choice, combined with the fact they wanted an Italian education for their children. And this is what Bruna told me. She said, my mother put me there because they would say she's white and so she's be it's better for her being with other Italians and going to school. She says to me, my mother, you know I brought you there because you were with Italian nuns and you, you needed to learn Italian. Uh, Bruna was left in a collegio very early. Uh, usually from archival research it appears that um, children were, were, were left there when they were around seven or eight. Bruna was left there when she was two. And uh, after that her mother left, she went to Ethiopia. So she will see her mother once a year for half an hour. And Bruna never understood the reasons for this choice. Um, so she felt abandoned. And uh, once she clearly, she asked her mom. And she said, mom, why you didn't take me to Ethiopia with you? And you know what she said to me? Because I was ashamed, you were too white. This is what she said to me, and imagine that she never introduced me to her mother or father. She told them that she had a baby girl, but she never said I was a meticcia. Sometimes I tell her about the collegio, but it hurts her as she feels bad for abandoning me, while she instead looked after her nephews, her brothers and sister, and she threw me away. So, when she realized, Bruna was really shocked because she realized not only that her mother was ashamed of her daughter and her color, but also that she had excluded her from entering the circle of the family. Um, 
Bruna's mother acknowledged the existence of a baby girl, but she omitted to say that she was a mixed race girl, and as this would have implied admitting she had a sexual relationship with a white Italian man who left her afterward. So now we skip a bit on time. Uh, it's 1960, so Bruna now is 18, and she left this collegio. I didn't put here, but uh, this college, as I said, they were run by uh, missionaries, and this missionary shared the same racist uh, values going on at the time. So Bruna was telling me about horrific uh, forms of violence these children, uh, the, children experience on an everyday basis. And they conducted quite a few interviews with these children, and they all mentioned the amount of violence, uh, not only physical, but also verbal, uh, towards their mothers. But 1960, World War II is over. Fascism is apparently ended. In the meantime, Eritrea has been annexed to Ethiopia in 1962, and this triggered a devastating war between these two countries. Therefore, all Italians who had decided to stay in Eritrea even after World War II, they were all brought back to Italy. And Bra Bruna was one of them. Just for mixed-race Italian, this migration was particularly important. They had very high expectation because they were not just moving to a safer place, they were moving to their other motherland. And nevertheless, their expectations crumbled once they faced the impacts of racializing practices operating in Italy and how the gays fixed and located their body in specific racial positions. From the interviews, one may notice a feeling of shock associated with the arrival in Italy. And the main cause of shock experienced by the participants seems to be in relation to their visual experience. Uh, so Bruna took a boat, she crossed the Mediterranean, but it was a very different crossing from today. So she took this boat from Massawa in the coast and she arrived in Naples. And she's shocked, she says to me. The impact with Italy was shocking. In Eritrea, I would see wealthy Italians, but when I arrived in Naples by boat, I saw everyone begging for money. It was a dirty city, children were half naked. It was a big shock. And Bruno associates Italianness to wealthy economic condition. For her, all white Italians were affluent considering the way they, they lived their lifestyle in Eritrea. And not respondent at a similar, as a similar um, shock. And she says to me, seeing an Italian working, an Italian man working as a porter, this was my first shock. I would have never ever imagined that a white man could work as a porter. This just didn't exist in Eritrea. Eritreans did those kind of jobs. For me, seeing an Italian man behind the bar, behind the counter of a bar and serving me coffee, this was shocking. So this shock of the gays uh, experienced by the respondents raised from, I would say, the disruption of, fami of what uh, Baba called the familiar alignment of post-colonial subjects. So these hierarchies they had uh, internalized in Eritrea and that they thought to repeat uh, in Italy. Furthermore, the construction of their identity as Metici also changed when they arrived in Italy and when they were confronted to the different racialization of their body. In Eritrea, they were considered too white or not black enough to be part of the community. Uh, plus, in Eritrea, they had been raised by both of their parents as Italian. They believed that having an Italian father, an Italian surname, speaking Italian, was a sign of their Italianness. And then they arrived in Italy, and this is what Bruna uh, told me, this very shocking experience, and I apologize for use of certain words. She said, and one day I was walking down the street when a woman said, hey you, Negro. Negro is for us the N-word, okay? It's not just a racial connotation, it's the N-word. And she said, I turned around and saw no Negroes at the time. In the 1960s, you wouldn't see many around. Again, she said, hey, you, Negro, I'm talking to you. I turned and said, are you talking to me? And she says, well, do you see any other Negroes around? My God, I flooded with tears, just like this, in the middle of the streets. 
And from that moment, I started to understand many things. Bruna's account, I find, has very strong references with the work of Franz Fanon, specifically an episode he mentioned when he was traveling on a train in France. And a, a white child uh, look at him and then says to his mother, screaming, look, mama, a Negro. So perfectly fitting Fanon words, Bruna's body seems to give him back to her sprawled out, distorted, recolored. She was no longer who she was before this encounter. Another example is uh, uh, provided by Rita, another respondent. Um, so it was time to go to vote. And so she approached the building, uh, the voting site. And um, this carabiniere uh, says to her, uh, Madam, where are you going? And she says, where do you think? Well, you know you, you cannot come in, right? And she says, well, that's strange because I've been invited to come here. So why can I, can I not? I took my ID out. He saw it and he said, oh, sorry. Back in my office, I repeated what happened. One of my colleagues became mental. He said, you should have told him to fuck off. Uh, no, why should I do that? I told him to the Carabiniere, in your opinion, how can someone even dare to come here if they're not Italian? So now every time I have to go there, I keep my ID in hand in order to avoid questions. And so I think here Rita conceptualizes for us the impact of being considered irremediably non-belonging. You don't need to speak, it's just your body carrying on your identity. And it just shows how the white look fixed the black body, again, as Fanon argues, and confirms how certain bodies are supernaturated, super saturated with meaning, as argued by Gooding Williams. Rita has not pronounced a word, but the act of speaking is not necessary, given that her body is already framed and embedded in a specific racial narrative. This episode shows a specific connection between space and bodies, already noted by Sarah Ahmed, like how some spaces are inhabitable for certain people. They're not accessible for certain people through the marker of whiteness. And as she noticed, the skin by the bodies that inhabit uh, them, um, sorry, Ahmed's work in, is useful in Rita's case and it helps to highlight how Italian public institutional spaces such as the voting site are shaped around whiteness or as Ahmed says, they are orientation devices shaped according to what resides within. So talking about vote now and citizenship, I would like to skip again uh, a bit of time and going to Mm, the current citizenship law, so 1992. Um, unlike the US uh, in the Italian national census, which is released by ISTAT every 10 years, there is no mention of the category ethnicity or race, considered as something discriminatory, mm, as affirmed by the third article of the Constitution, which ratifies that all citizens have equal social dignity and are equal before the law, without distinction of sex, race, language, religion, political opinion, personal and social conditions. So there are instead, how do we monitor diversity? Well, there are just a few questions. Uh, question 3.1, asking you, what is your citizenship? And question 3.2, asking, do you have Italian citizenship since your birth? And these are followed by questions aimed to verify the place of birth of your parents, namely question 3.4, where was your mother born? And 3.5, where was your father born? And these questions become really interesting if analyzing the light of the Italian citizenship law itself, whose implicit references to categories uh, such blood or race are to me quite striking. So, Italian citizenship is transmitted by blood through what is called jus sanguinis, namely the right of blood. And it says, Italian citizenship is mainly based on jus sanguinis according to which a child born to an Italian mother or father is Italian. 
Interestingly, descendants of Italian citizens who may not have been to Italy or who do not speak Italian may apply for citizenship if able to demonstrate the presence of Italian blood through a retracing procedure. And so this is what the consulate uh, says. The consulate retraces the citizenship on a, of a family that, for example, emigrated abroad in order to ascertain whether a person has the right to Italian citizenship. It will be necessary to prove that your ancestor was in possession of Italian citizenship at the time he or she left and maintained it throughout, passing it on to descendants. The birth certificate of that ancestor, which can be requested from the Office of Civil Statistic, um, of the birth and, uh, um, sorry, I don't want to read you the whole paragraph, but um, basically what the law says is that if you can provide evidence that you had an Italian ancestor and this ancestor maintained his or her citizenship throughout and pass it on, you can apply for citizenship. And I find these juridical uh, practices a bit paradoxical when you consider that today there is an estimation of 800,000 children who have been born in Italy and they're raised as uh, foreigner because they don't have the right blood. So they are not granted citizenship at birth, but rather they are deemed a bit outside the, the idea of the nation. And I would like to give you just a practical example. Uh, let's consider um, a child. Uh, let's imagine a hypothetical Ada, a 17-year-old born in Rome to Nigerian parents. Ada speaks only Italian. She has attended Italian school. And she has been to Nigeria only a couple of times in her life, uh, a few weeks each time during summer holidays. Ada is not entitled to Italian citizenship unless she can claim a tie to an Italian national through marriage or ancestry, which is not her case. Legally, she is considered a foreigner. As such, she holds a permesso di soggiorno, a short-term visa, which she must regularly renew until reaching legal adulthood. When she turns 18, Ada will, will only have 12 months to apply for citizenship, and, amongst other things, she will have to prove that she has lived continuously on the Italian soil and she has never omitted residence change. She has never forgotten to notify the change. Nonetheless, despite the correct application, many people may not be granted citizenship because of a number of reasons. One has to bear in mind that the procedure to apply for citizenship is subject to the discretionary criteria of the public administration, and bureaucratic negligence may sometimes cause the rejection of application. So legally foreigners, these Italian-born individuals, who are also called second generation, are subjected to a, num to a number of important limitations. For example, they cannot sit for public competitive examinations in order to get certain jobs. They cannot practice a number of professions where Italian citizenship is compulsory. Um, they cannot uh, always uh, play sports for free due to, to, due to the constraints and limitations imposed on them in relation to their status. In addition, they cannot study abroad through uh, exchange programs like we all do, like Erasmus is very popular. They can't do that. They're also denied the right to vote and to stand for election. Um, so unsurprisingly, such multi-layered levels of discrimination against those born and raised in Italy trigger a number of not only practical but also psychological difficulties in the everyday life as experienced by some members of the Rete G2 Seconda Generazioni. This one is a network created in 2005 by the children of immigrants. And so we have tried to kind of change this law and uh, I just wanted to show you a bit what was the response of a part of the political discourse. So this was very recent when Attilio Fontana, a member of Lega, Lega is this party who um, has quite few chance not to get go 
to the government, but to get a lot of votes in the in the next elections. Uh, they are now with um, Silvio Berlusconi and Meloni. She, he said, non possiamo accettare tutti gli immigrati che arrivano, dobbiamo decidere se la nostra etnia, la nostra razza bianca, la nostra società devono continuare a esistere o essere cancellate. So, uh, we cannot accept all immigrants coming. We have to decide if our ethnicity, our white race, our society uh, should keep on existing or they have to be erased. So it's 2018, but I think it could have been 1938, wouldn't be very different. Um, again, uh, Silvio Berlusconi, who is with his party, uh, that I was reading earlier how his party with Lega and Meloni, they're apparently 40% now, according to the latest uh, surveys. Berlusconi said, yeah, we have, si è aggiunta una criminalità di 476.000 immigrati che per mangiare devono delinquere. La prima cosa che svaliggiano in una casa è il frigorifero e ciò è causato dal modo con cui il nostro paese non ha saputo rispondere all'immigrazione. So he's saying how we have a certain number of migrants who in order to eat they need to commit crimes and the first thing they... Uh, they kind of um, svaligiano, like they steal in a, in a house, is, is the fridge. Because this is the way our country uh, has dealt with immigration or has not dealt with immigration. Hmm? And so this is, yeah, the part I was telling you about. But also I found some images showing you how citizenship is representing when people try to change uh, the law. So uh, there was a very heated debate about this use sanguinis, use soli. Uh, in the parliament there were very heated discussions. So this was a, a member of Lega again who uh, showed this banner saying, citizenship is not a gift. Mm. So again, this idea that you need to gain your citizenship is not because you were born here that you, are, you have the right to be Italian. Uh, it's not a gift. Um, and these were some of the adverts going on when the debate was really uh, at the peak. So uh, the, the third one I think is really interesting because uh, this is from uh, La Russa who said, l'Italia, if we approve the change of the law, so if we go from use sanguinis to use soli, uh, Italia diventerà la sala parto dell'Africa. So Italy is going to become the delivery room of Africa. And this is very distorting and fake because the change of the law never implied to go directly from use sanguinis to use soli. There, there are very strict criteria before a child can get Italian citizenship if this bill would have passed, mm, was not that you arrive in this country, you deliver a baby and this baby is Italian. But this is what the message was, was sent. And l'Italia, a chi la ama, obviously if you love Italy, you cannot be pro uh, use soli. And this one is probably my favorite. This is from Casa Pound, uh, extreme right-wing party getting a lot of visibility at the moment. And so here they're really telling you how easy it is to be Italian. This is the only way. So uh, you can see there is a pregnant woman who is a, a white Italian. And the arrows indicating the baby, they say Italiana, Italiano, uh, easy, isn't it? So this is clearly, yeah, I don't think couldn't have been clearer and easier than that to, to explain their concept. It's just if you were born by that belly, if you have that color. Um, so, to conclude, uh, I think that such a formulation of citizenship based on this idea of right blood uh, seem to show some legacy uh, from what we have talked uh, earlier, from the liberal and fascist discourse on identity, such as the Code, Codice per la Colonia or the law in 1933. 
Although craniology and phrenology are not used any longer to determine Italianness, there are still some principles that recall some disturbing heritage. And being in possession of an Italian passport does not prevent racial profiling, hate crimes, the ethnization of criminality legitimated by the state, or racial discrimination against non-white Italians on several fronts. The analysis of the ambiguous racial status of Italian and the consequent racial construction of the other, however, cannot be reduced to an issue of blood or binary oppositions between black and white. As I tried to highlight the nexus of race, citizenship, belonging at the core of Italian identity, is composed by a multiple and amalgam of intersectional discursive practices acting simultaneously. As Tatiana Petrovic argues, Italians travel inhabit, transform, and shift the color line divide between black and white by reshaping and resignifying blackness and whiteness and the boundaries between these two categories. Um, so I read recently, 22nd of February, the latest Amnesty International report about Italy, Italy has been released. And they were saying how at the moment Italy is a country um, drenched in hate and xenophobia and there is this noi uh, us against you, noi contro voi uh, dichotomy going on. And they also says um, that in, um, um, yeah, there are NGOs being blamed a lot uh, so they, they portray a very difficult, uh, a very complicated situation in which uh, messages like Italians first or uh, sostituzione etnica, ethnic substitution because of the presence of migrants are getting a, a lot of uh, consensus. However, they also show how uh, this year has really uh, surprisingly has marked a very high level of engagement from civil society. Now more than ever, people have been protesting and rebelling against this. And so my final question is for us being here in this site, how is knowledge produced? And how can we counterbalance the weight of master narratives defining who we are? how to reclaim a voice. And so, as a scholar, uh, I think that through the challenge and subversion of this course, through what uh, Anne Laura Stoller called the production of the narrative and the prevalence of the telling, through the use of research and writing as acts of social justice, through the use of decolonizing research methods, enabling us to discover alternative epistemologies, we can help us, these tools can help us to dismantle dominant and oppressive master narratives at the core of mainstream processes of knowledge production and to reclaim those alternative epistemologies and subjugated knowledges able to challenge invisible and untouchable locations of power. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Kristen Melia. I come from Napoli. I study race and immigration at Federico Secondo University in Naples. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you can comment on differences, whether real or perceived, in the attitude towards race, citizenship, and migration in the north versus the south of Italy. I say this because coming from Napoli, we have a kind of self-aggrandizing mythology of racial mixing, harking back to the days of the Amalfi Republic. And today, on the one hand, we tend to embrace recent arrivals and have-nots. On the other hand, there is a real resistance towards seeing people of color in positions of power, in positions of equal standing. And how do we reconcile that difference in the North and the South? And can we have an honest conversation about race when many members, even of the liberal 
Neapolitan intelligentsia tend to think of race as a social construct of which they are a part. Mm -mm. Yes, so um, the north-south divide, right? So you were talking about the internal divisions in Italy before the arrival. Um, yeah, obviously, um, there, when you study this kind of history, you learn about how the before colonizing Africa in Italy, we can say there was a sort of internal colonization uh, in, the, in the south and how southern Italians, they were labeled as the other, as the blacks other, because this, even this geographical proximity to Africa. However, I think the key element there is obviously whiteness, because at some point, even if you're a marginalized white, you're still white. So you are encapsulated in, main, in, in the mainstream uh, whiteness at a certain historical point is inevitable. And so, this obviously creates a new other. And when you have been the other, I think is really, you have this strong desire not to be associated with this new other coming because you know what it means. So, uh, but I think the north-south divide in Italy is not something that um, has ended. Like there is still uh, a lot of, uh, frictions, but it's interesting to see politically, for example, this party, Lega, is not anymore Lega Nord. Hmm? Before it was Lega Nord, and it was an anti-South party, so the rhetoric was really, let's separate Italy, we don't want to be with these people. Um, and now, the party strategically dropped Nord, and now it's just Lega. And it's very interesting to notice how when the leader of the party goes down south, recently went to Reggio Calabria, and apparently there was a lot, uh, a lot of audience. So I think there is these practices of othering that are always changing and they're very mutable. So I'm really not sure how <laughs> to reconcile this, uh, this divide. Um, I think it's a very complicated uh, issue. Uh, first off, thanks so much. <laughs> I was curious too about when you were talking earlier more in the colonial aspects, there was a lot of influences of scientific racism and I was wondering if you could see any of those hap like scientific racism manifesting in today's society and how that might influence the current political debate going on right now mm -mm. in people's ideas of like the right of blood and so on. Yeah, that's why I, I picked this image and that other quote um, because when I, when I heard that quote, for me, sorry, it should be here. This, for me, is really uh, the presence of uh, all a literature and so-called scientific knowledge that we thought has been, had been dismantled, but in reality, we can see how it traveled a bit through history, because I think it's saying in 2018, la nostra razza bianca is quite, how else could have defined this if not scientific racism? Mm? And this is the point of this topic, to see how certain beliefs are not dead, but they actually very present in contemporary Italy. Um, obviously, I don't want to generalize. As I said, there is a lot of resistance, but at the same time, there is this very worrying surge of these new um, um, beliefs that have a very precise heritage, I think. Yeah, hi, thanks. Sorry for the broken voice, but it's really cold. Uh, um, my name is Yusuf. I'm a researcher at the European University Institute here, just a couple of hundred meters up north. Um, thanks for your presentation. Um, I was really interested in this uh, concept that you used, the Italian self-reflexive color blindness, and it reminded me of um, 
a concept made uh, made popular in the Netherlands, where I'm from, mm -hmm. um, of uh, Gloria Wecker. You might know her, White Innocence. Um, and it really reminded me of that. Now, my question is about this nexus of citizenship, racism, and um, belonging, which is also the title of your talk. So I'm, I, I'm convinced, and I think you completely justified the racism part, but I'm still unclear about how citizenship and belonging comes in into mm -hmm. this nexus, because I think it's really complex. Because if we take this whole use solely um, uh, discussion that's going on in Italy, obviously many European countries already have used solely uh, uh, rules and regulations, yeah. right? Um, German, uh, for instance, the Netherlands. Germany even switched from use sanguinis to use solely. And you start to wonder, okay, what difference did that make for belonging? for instance, mm -mm. and did that make it any, any better? So Gloria Wecker just came out with White Innocence, I mean, last year, right? Mm -hmm. okay. Making the exact same analysis, more or less, that you're really interestingly making in the case of Italy. So I'm wondering, okay, so even if we go beyond that use solely discussion in Italy, yeah, so that's, what? That's the yeah. point, actually, as I said, is not, even if you get this passport, is not this piece of paper that gives you a sense of belonging. Mm? Um, in fact, as I wanted to start my paper, it was about analyzing my experience mm? and how very often uh, I'm asked this famous, infamous question, uh, where are you from? And when I respond, saying from Rome, uh, there is a, this kind of digging, mm? but where are you really from? And this question for me is already a dissecting question. It's a question that makes me feel I do not belong because it's not a reciprocated question. I don't ask why do you speak such a good Italian when I meet someone or I don't ask where are you from or even where are you really from. And, uh, or I, I don't have my body dissected um, like uh, in one of the cases I wanted to analyze. Someone would say, but okay, you're saying that you're Italian, but how can you be Italian with that hair? And this was said straight to my face, you know? So these episodes, uh, despite I'm Italian since birth, I have my passport and everything, these everyday episodes, they kind of give me a sense of non-belonging sometimes. Uh, so it's not the piece of paper. And although I legally belong, somehow I don't belong. And I think this is the complicacy of this matter. So the new generation, for example, Rete Gidua, they're really uh, keen in getting the bill changed. And I think it's, it's going to be probably a good thing. But we have to go beyond that. It's not just the use solely use sanguinist dichotomy that needs to be addressed. I think it's really the idea of identity. What does it mean to be Italian? As I said, for many people, whiteness is taken for granted. That's why when someone like me says I'm Italian, there is a bit of disruption, thinking, no, but there must be something else. You can't just be Italian, this dissecting intention. And so, yeah, this was for me the part connecting the racism to citizenship and belonging. I hope that helped. <coughs> Thank you for your talk. Uh, maybe we should clarify that the Jung Sanguinis was adopted already in 1865 during the literal period uh, adopted by the Italian Civil Code. And the, the turning point actually took place in 1912 uh, with the adoption of a new law which fostered the principle of use sanguinis for reasons of foreign policy, right? Following the uh, defeat of Adwa, Italy uh, was undergoing a massive uh, uh, exodus of people, of Italians, uh, and as the country seemed unable to uh, create its own empire, uh, it was seen, the adoption, the fostering of the Eusolis was seen as the only possible option to have somehow an Italian community, right, mm -hmm. all over the world. Um, and this is as far as the Eusolis is concerned. As far as today, I would say that uh, 
the revival of fascism and racism in the last few uh, years has a lot to do with the severe economic crisis that the country is undergoing. This is certainly not a justification, but I think we have to explain uh, this kind of phenomena, right? Uh, this um, revival is taking place, especially in the peripheries, abandoned by the Italian states, and I'm thinking about not only Rome, uh, because we used to know, right, that Rome uh, had a very high degree of uh, uh, fascist consent. Uh, today, that is spread to the peripheries of the northern and southern Italian cities. As I said, we have to try to find an explanation for that. Uh, and certainly what we are experiencing is that in the past we used to say that uh, there was no competition for jobs, for instance, between Italians and immigrants. Well, today there's a, a scarcity of resources in this country and there is a competition between Italians and foreigners in terms of housing, in terms of jobs, right? And this is true uh, even for the poorest jobs in the country. So what is lacking here for sure is a proper political class, right? Absolutely, Thank you. yeah. Thank you so much for this comment, Natalia. Um, I really, it's really important to make this clarification. Also, yeah, I, I, I didn't have time to say, but between 1890 and 1916, Italy saw almost 14 million people live in the country. 14 million people. So it was the biggest uh, uh, mass migration recorded in history. And so the law came also in order to kind of reconfigure this mass of Italians going abroad, going to Brazil, to Argentina, to North America, who actually uh, were sometimes imposed to adopt a new citizenship in order to become a new productive force for the new country. So I think there are obviously several reasons why uh, there is youth sanguine, but obviously my focus was on those who are, who experience this law uh, on, from a different perspective. So more the kind of personal and cultural um, side. Anyone? Okay, well, I guess <laughs> thank you very much for being here, and there's a reception for everyone. Thank you. Thank you.